For those of you who aren't aware, this is a, a, a trial of rehabilitation, as uh, John mentioned in the highlights, and, and specifically targeting patients with HEFPEF, of course, where we've got a very high unmet need. Um, so I'm delighted to be the co-chief investigator. I'm sure everybody will be familiar with Chim Lang in Dundee. So um, Chim's the, the clinical lead and I, I'm his scientific um, shotgun. So what's the study looking at? Well, it's looking at the clinical and cost effectiveness of adding the REACH HF home-based intervention to usual care alone in, in people with HEFPEF and also their caregivers. So not only are we measuring outcomes in heart failure patients here, but, but also their caregivers in, in both groups. NIHR funded. Um, I'll come back to it. We, we, we have struggled a bit with recruitment, but I'm delighted to say we're, we're now up to full capacity. So we, we promised NIHR we'd open 20 sites in England, Scotland and Wales. And you can see we've got a very nice um, national distribution. Our target is 520 HEFPEF patients and how many of those that come in with caregivers? Obviously, not every patient is a caregiver. And the reason we're going for 520 is, is that we're powered on a minimally important difference on the Minnesota living with heart failure. And the primary outcome is at 12 months, although we're also measuring outcomes at baseline uh, and at four months follow up. So just a couple of final comments from me. So progress at the moment. Um, any of you who are sites on this study, my, my sincere thanks for all your hard work. Um, we did have a, a naughty step NIHR review in, in November. Uh, as you are well aware, many NIHR trials are struggling. We struggled because we just couldn't get sites open. Once we've got them open, they've been fine. And just one of the top tips, if you do end up on the, the naughty step, one of the things that really helped us persuade NIHR to keep us open, and in fact, they've allowed us to stick with our 520, we've got a, a, a funded um, extension to the study. So we'll now close in May, but was really the importance of the question. So really demonstrating to NIHR that this is a population with a high unmet need. And of course, really having access to any evidence based treatments is, is terribly important. And, and really, that was a clincher in allowing us to go forward. So just to say, and the last comment from me, very happy to take questions. We are, we're at this moment in time. We're actually now up to 225 patients. So we're almost halfway up the mountain and 66 caregivers um, recruited to date. So thanks very much. And as I say, any questions, I'd be delighted to take them. OK, so uh, well, that's great news uh, and uh, great news that uh, the study was uh, refunded and uh, I saw the refunding application and it really was uh, a tour de force and uh, you know, gave the NIHR a number of options, but uh, led them to the option that you um, that was your preferred option, I think. So, yeah, yeah, uh, good. Um, you're not looking for more sites. Well, I should have said that, John, that, you know, we, we, we've got to our 20 sites, but, you know, the more sites we open, the quicker we will be to 520. So certainly if anybody's on the call or if we are extending you know, um, our, our slides out to, to other groups beyond this. We, we'd be very interested. I think what we do need to say, John, is, is that, that this needs to be a site that has two things. So one, our HEFPEF patients, you've all got those, but also an existing rehab programme, because we basically need to leverage off that existing programme, train up the staff to deliver this home-based intervention. And I know for some sites that just hasn't been the case because again, rehab is very spotty um, still across the NHS. I think the last thing I should also say, John, is, is I should have a shout out to the registry because since the National Registry has gone online, we've seen an uptick in our, um, in our recruitment. And that's because we agreed with Chris Miller very early on that sites who are participating in the registry could co-recruit 
to to our trial. And I think that's just such a neat added value, particularly in terms of the investment, mm -hmm. the co-investment of NIHR and BHF and some of these activities. So I would just like yeah. to thank Chris and his team um, for giving us that opportunity. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if Chris, as he, I think he's on. I don't know if he wants to say anything. Uh, I do notice that Chris has more centres than you have. So uh, so th there might be room for a few more to uh, to bring in. Yeah, so certainly anybody who's interested on the call tonight or beyond uh, and wants to drop me an email, very happy to have a natter with them about the detail of what's required and whether they'd like to come on board. Thanks, John. OK. Uh, that's great. Peter's for better. I'm, I'm from Leeds. I'm a consultant cardiologist and a uh, position of associate professor at the university there. And I'm going to tell you in eight minutes the story of Cross HF and how we've got it funded. Um, so I start off with a question of how we investigate patients with heart failure. And this is a case I showed at the British Society of Cardiac. Uh, magnetic resonance, um, which th this case is a 70 year old man who presents with uh, to the emergency department with breathlessness. His troponin is mildly elevated but non dynamic and leads to the upper limit of normal is 50. So this is three times the upper limit of normal, his troponin, and non dynamic. And he has moderate LVST without a warm motion abnormality. He started on fruzamide, rampril, and bisoprolol and sent home. You can see there his echo and his ECG. And I asked the uh, at BSCMR what people made of this and what tests they would do next. And the answer universally, I don't think anyone disagreed, was that he would get an invasive angiogram at their hospital, which which is which is perhaps a little surprising because um, because uh, when you speak to people, that perhaps their practice is different. And these are the um, these are the guidelines from ESC, which. Um, which tell us which test we should be doing to, look, to investigate for coronary artery disease in, in patients newly presenting with heart failure. So ESC recommend CTCA as a 2A recommendation for uh, patients with a low pretest probability. Uh, they recommend functional testing with a 2B recommendation, level of evidence B. Um, for the assessment of ischemia and viability, in patients with CAD who are considered suitable for revascularization, and they suggest invasive angiography for patients with HEF-REF with intermediate to high pretest probability of CAD um, and the presence of ischemia on non-invasive tests. And that's level of uh, that's recommendation 2B level of evidence B. And I think the important thing here is that the, the level of evidence is, is B or C for all. And I think there's a there's a lot of room for interpretation within these recommendations. So the other the other piece of background information is just what we do in the UK. So in the UK at the moment, from our pilot data and published data, it's about 20% of patients with a new diagnosis of heart failure get an invasive angiogram. Uh, in Denmark, who have um, you know very complete health records, it's 17%. The graphs on the right show that the amount of investigation is is increasing year on year, but it seems to be a combination of invasive angiography, CTCA and and functional testing. And in the States, the it's about a third of the patients who get an invasive angiogram. And there's this uh, these nice, nice data from Jack from 2022, which show there are quite big discrepancies in who who gets investigated with an invasive angiogram. So for example, if you've got significant mental illness, if you are not white, if you're a woman, if you're older, you're less likely to get investigated invasively. So, so I, I, I'm on this NIHR commissioning committee and I took this idea to them a few couple of years ago now about, um, you know, there's this, this, there's this wide variation in how patients are treated. There's a lack of clarity from the guidelines about what what we should do and there's a um and there's uncertainty and they were interested and they said it's a good idea but um i needed to convince them a bit more so we got some patient feedback from from actually from the bsh um from your uh, patient representative group and you know it was really clear 
that a lot of patients had had an invasive angiogram. They weren't particularly clear on why they'd had it. They certainly weren't particularly enthusiastic about it. And most patients agreed that they didn't, you know, as part of the pathway for a new diagnosis of heart failure, an angiogram was not necessarily something that they wanted. So this commission brief went out from NIHR asking for a, um, a randomised controlled trial for patients with heart failure to investigate invasive angiography versus CTCA versus, versus alternative tests, uh, which was up to us. Uh, secondary care outpatients was, was what it was originally proposed as. Um, and then they they have um, NHR, as, as I'm sure you all know, they like hard outcomes. So it was heart failure, hospitalisation and all-cause mortality and um, patient reported outcomes. And um, so we, we put in an application to this and over the past year or so, um, we've debated various points with, with NHR and, and maybe changed the, the um, the brief slightly, but we have we have fulfilled what they what they required, and so we've come up with this with this RCT now, which is an RCT of three thousand patients newly presenting with heart failure. It's an invasive strategy. Um, yeah, sorry, is is a strategy of cross sectional imaging, hence cross HFs, with CTCA or stress MR non inferior to invasive angiography, um, and that's specifically with regard to uh, major adverse events, patient reported outcomes and cost effectiveness. And so it's an open label randomized controlled trial with patients randomized one to one to one to invasive coronary angiography, CTCA and stress CMR. And so I will put the flow chart up, which I hope you can see, which, which I hope um, makes things a little bit clearer. And we've tried to make this really as inclusive as possible. So the inclusion criteria are very broad and hopefully, hopefully very representative of what we see in heart failure clinics and on the wards. And this is patients with symptoms of heart failure with either heart failure hospitalisation, an ejection fraction of less than 40%, or if they have an ejection fraction greater than 40%, either a BMP of greater than 300 in sinus rhythm or 600 in AF. And they're randomised to one of those three tests and then they continue their normal routine care with device therapy or uh, uh, guideline directed medical therapy or revascularization if, if felt to be clinically appropriate. We've tried to make the exclusion criteria as um, you know as, uh, to, to maximize inclusivity uh, so there's very limited exclusion criteria so that's patients who have previously been investigated for coronary artery disease where there's a clear alternative diagnosis such as amyloid or HCM or something severe primary valvular heart disease or um, significant comorbidity, and they're really the only exclusion criteria. And the primary endpoint is a composite of death, heart failure hospitalisation and MI, with a time to event non-inferiority analysis of cross-sectional imaging versus invasive angiography. And the secondary endpoints include, include similar things, but also then patient reported outcome measures, cost effectiveness. 3,000 patients is a, is very big, and it did start off smaller, but with um, um, an IHR suggested to us that it should be a non-inferiority design, and then they asked for other things, and it ended up becoming a 3,000 uh, patient trial. The non-inferiority margin, an absolute non-inferiority margin of 6%, means that if in the invasive angiography arm, at the end of the trial, if 35% of the patients have had a, a, a primary outcome, so long as less than 41% in the cross-sectional arm have um, have an out, have an event, then it would be deemed non-inferior. So that's the 6% absolute margin. And that's actually pretty pretty conservative for a um, for a cardiology non-inferiority trial, and certainly very, very, very conservative for a um, for an imaging trial. Um, Minimum duration of follow-up is 12 months and it's funded for up to five and a half years by, by HTA. Um, and the, the feasibility that we provided to them was based on 20 sites recruiting 10 patients, uh, sorry, five patients a month. And when we go through the heart failure audit data, we, we think that most hospitals will have 25 eligible patients per month presenting with heart failure. We're hoping to, hope, hoping to open in October. We start off like, I think like most trials, from BHF and NIHR with a with a vanguard phase, 
where we've um, set ourselves a target of opening 10 sites and recruiting 100 patients within the first within the first nine months. Um, we um, all, all sites basically they only need access to the three tests, so stress CMR, CTCA and ICA, that's all you need to take part. We're very, very keen that this is a trial of heart failure patients recruited by the heart failure MDT and not, you know, images doing imaging tests. The imaging is a means to an end, but this is very much about the patient with heart failure. We're designing the protocol to be very, very light touch, so there'll be no follow up contact with the patients. Everything's done by um, review of electronic records and longer term follow up will be done by HES data. Um, there is some quality of life questionnaires which will be sent directly to patients, hopefully by um, We've been doing it and on another trial I work on. We've been doing it by text message and we found that works pretty well. And hopefully we can we can develop some of these things to really make it as easy as possible for patients and as easy as possible for sites. And um, I think that's it. And I think I've stuck to time. So um, importantly, there's my my email address at the bottom and Laura is the manager from Leeds. So if you we're still, obviously, we're looking for sites, and that, that'll be our first ask. Is if if people are interested, please um, please get in touch with myself or Laura. Over to okay. you. Okay. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Gavin Murphy. I'm a uh, a cardiac surgeon in Leicester, and I'm talking to you today about the uh, the Stitch Three Basis Four trial. And can you see my slides? Yes, we can. So this is a trial of surgery versus uh, PCI for people with ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy or ischemic left ventricular systolic dysfunction, where there is a, an indication for revascularization. And it's co-led by myself, a surgeon, and Devaka, who's a, an interventional cardiologist who, as you know, led the REVIVE trial with Mark. Let's see about moving my slides. So uh, we're hoping to fill the, the gap between uh, the findings of the STITCH trial, which suggested that coronary artery bypass grafting reduced uh, mortality in people with ischemic left ventricular systolic dysfunction versus uh, no revascularization and revived, which showed no survival benefit for uh, PCI versus optimal medical therapy in people with ischemic left ventricular systolic dysfunction. And we felt that there was a gap here, a knowledge gap with respect to whether or not cabbage or PCI was a better therapy for people with ischemic left ventricular systolic dysfunction who undergo uh, revascularization. And we did some uh, epidemiology in this, and there's approximately 20,000 people in the UK with uh, LVSD who undergo revask uh, every year. So we thought that this was a, an area of uncertainty. There was variation in care and it would be a useful research question. Uh, some other considerations is that uh, the STITCH population, which the STITCH trials over almost 20 years old now revived, is much more recent. The STITCH trial uh, recruited younger people who had uh, were more likely to have angina was revived. They are older with less angina. Um, also, the STITCH trial uh, took part in a different era. It took part in you know before the the uh, development of new medication uh, and a time when ICD and CRT therapy was really uh, uh, not standard of care. And therefore, uh, there is. Uh, a legitimate question as to whether or not uh, cabbage uh, is still uh, 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 the it, there's still a, a class one indication according to the American Heart Association indication for revascularization in these patients or whether or not PCI is equally as effective. There is some uncertainty in the in the guidelines. The most recent ESC guideline gives cabbage a two A uh, a, a recommendation uh, for people with IL, uh, ischemic left ventricular systolic dysfunction, the American Heart Association gives it a class one indication. Uh, and they really reserve PCI for people where they're unsuitable or unfit for surgery for whatever reason. Uh, um, but as I say, these guidelines, uh, they're not supported by uh, any direct head-to-head -head comparison of P PCI and cabbage in these groups. And as we see, there's wide variation 
which ranges from about uh, about a quarter of people having PCI in some uh, uh, clinical commissioning groups in the UK uh, to about half of them having PCI. So there's very wide variation. The trial will be part of the uh, International Stitch 3 Consortium, which is a, a trial of PCI versus cabbage in people who have undergone optimal medical and other and device therapy. Uh, it's an international consortium in uh, nine countries. Uh, and I think as it stands, five of those countries have, have been awarded individual funding to run trials in their countries. And this will be the UK arm of that, which although it has a slightly UK bent, will contribute money, um, will contribute um, data to the to the uh, the Stitch 3 uh, individual patient data meta-analysis or Bayesian analysis, whatever they use to analyze the data. The PICO for BASIS-4 is uh, patients with multivessel disease, a documented indication for revascularization, and where the MDT thinks that either therapy, uh, uh, or whether, whether either therapy is indicated or whether it's not clear which, which would be better. Uh, it's best contemporary practice at individual centres, so revascularization by, revascularization by PCI. Uh, patients should have had optical, optimal medical therapy. They should be using intravascular imaging. They should have the capacity to do advanced PCI. Uh, and coronary artery bypass grafting will be uh, the, the best available technique by centre. Uh, the primary outcome is a composite endpoint of all-cause mortality or cardiovascular rehospitalization, ascertained using routinely collected healthcare data up to five years post-operatively. Uh, the inclusion criteria are an L uh, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40% quant quantified by any uh, mode, any imaging or, or diagnostic test within the last 12 months. We want this to be a very pragmatic trial. A significant amount of myocardium at risk uh, defined by a basis jeopardy score of greater than or equal to six, and that the heart team have confirmed the indication for revascularization. We aim to recruit uh, 630 patients over uh, 48 months in 28 centres, uh, and we have some contingency around that. And we have identified 28 centres that have uh, indicated their capacity and willingness and equipoise to randomise. At the minute, we are just about to submit our IRAS. We've got the forms of gone for sponsor review. So hopefully uh, IRAS submission before the end of February and then recruitment uh, one month behind schedule in April. Uh, exclusion criteria that might be of interest. Uh, we're, a, uh, we're excluding uh, recent ST elevation myocardial infarction within 72 hours because we don't think that there is equipoise around how those patients should be treated with REVASC, uh, where PCI would be clearly the preferred option. Any uh, coexistent valvular heart disease that might require surgery is an exclusion. Pregnancy is an exclusion for reasons that uh, uh, remain a mystery to me. It seems to be a legacy uh, that started off in an ethical committee once upon a time, but now is present in every single trial that we do. Uh, and then people who are unwilling to undergo long-term follow-up. Uh, this is our data uh, processing map. So we'll be using uh, uh, routinely collected healthcare data for ascertainment of the primary outcome. Our health economics will use a, a new HealthBit app, which is a, an app that's uh, been designed for the trial, which will collect uh, qualitative uh, PROMS data, health economic data, and we've got some specific adverse events. There is a, a, a will be a data transfer agreement to uh, Sweden, who will be the data controller for the Stitch 3 trial, and the data processor analysis will be at the University of Oxford. And that's the end of it. Um, thanks for inviting me to talk to this forum. I'm Henry Savage. I'm a cardiologist in Essex. And I want to talk to you about a score that we currently use um, in our local health economy and see whether or not it's something we can take forward. 
the experts in this room, we've got multiple drug therapies for our patients with heart failure. And when the era of doing pragmatic studies that will be useful, it's become more important now more than ever that our patients have a very clearly defined pathway from diagnosis to decisions about advanced therapies uh, that they may need. But we know that treatment inertia continues to exist and the uh, risks of deferring treatments are well documented in this group of patients. Could heart failure drug treatment scores work? These are scores that could be visible to both clinician and the patients and perhaps influence their treatment. The adherence score was developed as part of the qualified registry with Ivabrodine. But this required you to calculate an actual treatment score and then divide it by a theoretical treatment score based on the treatments that the patient was receiving. And the OMT score, which uh, many of you would have seen, was essentially developed to compare the adequacy of baseline medical therapies across clinical trials. Uh, none include an SGLT2 inhibitor for good reason, um, but most importantly, none are used routinely in everyday clinical practice. We developed a score which we've written about uh, based on the dose and number of foundational drugs a patient may receive. But most importantly, we wanted a score that was easy to calculate, so a whole number score by any member of the MDT, and one that could easily be adoptable. Uh, there's a patient scores for each of the foundational drugs they are prescribed, and there's a weighted score attached to patients who receive 50% or more of the target dose. An additional weight is given if they were prescribed quadruple therapy, such that a patient can only score excellent if they were on quadruple therapy, which should be the gold standard, but we have the option to uh, document exceptions where patients, for one reason or the other, cannot tolerate those drugs, as is this patient, a sample clinic letter, where they could not tolerate an aldosterone antagonist because of hyperkalemia and also could not tolerate a potassium binder. And in this patient who was receiving sort of maximum drug treatment, we've seen a small signal in our you know, single site analysis of the quad score in terms of short term outcomes. We've also been able to demonstrate that when you present the score to on one prescribed prescribing clinicians, it was easy for them to use in clinical scenarios with the average time to calculate the score in 90 seconds across three different grades of clinicians. And this resulted in optimization of medical therapy in about 80% of these patients. So what we really want to do is to see if this was useful in a larger cohort of patients. We want to look at patients who have been managed within the era of contemporary foundational drug treatment, allowing for adoption delays for SGLT2 inhibitors following their licensing and hopefully being able to collect data for up to 12 months for our patients in terms of our primary outcome measures. We'll be looking at the quad score in the different groups against endpoints such as mortality and hospitalizations for heart failure. We have several exploratory outcomes which are probably useful for healthcare planning, particularly in our heart failure population with our staffing issues, so time to final drug optimization and reasons for exceptions where patients cannot tolerate the drug treatments that may be beneficial for them. So we're looking for centers who have a very clearly defined heart failure titration clinic, the ambulatory patients who come in and go and who are already collecting data. We believe this data is available. I spoke to John about this a few months ago and we thought, okay, let's see if we can get centers from within the UK who already collect this data. This is a schematic recruitment chart, and these are patients from within our center. Uh, importantly, there's a clearly defined start date for titration and an end date for titration. The black uh, sections show how long or the time to optimization for each patient. Again, this is just a schematic. It's a pilot data. Our statistician thinks we might need up to 2,500 patients to make any statistical sense of the results we get, but even if we under recruit, we think it will still be useful as a pilot for us to uh, 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 test in a much larger heart failure registry that we have uh, requested access to. Our data collecting tool is uh, simple. Uh, the collect contains data points that most of you already collected uh, in routine clinical practice, but again, importantly, for the purposes of anal analysis, we will need clearly defined start and end dates in, in, in those clinics. 
because you'll be sharing anonymized data, we will expect centers will obviously seek R&D guidance locally. This is not a randomized controlled trial. There's been some excellent trials presented already today. Um, and uh, we don't expect informal ethics required, but watch this space. So that's me. Um, these are my co-collaborators, Jason Dungu and Tony DeMarco, who's on the call as well. If you're interested in taking part, um, I'll be grateful for you to make contact. Uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions. OK, we have a few minutes for questions. I'll remind you the next meeting is 8th of May. Um, 